Today's topic are non-conforming interfaces. After, first, uh, after a quick introduction, uh, we'll go into details of the mortar and Nietzsche type mortaring methods and uh, afterwards highlight a few applications. So let's get started. What are non-conforming interfaces? Um, in principle, for standard finite element methods, we need conforming grids, uh, like on the lower left side, uh, with a very fine grid. And if we have uh, uh, some features we don't have to resolve with a fine resolution, we can coarsen the grid. Uh, but this does not give us good grid quality. So our op optimal solution would be to use um, non-conforming grids uh, as in the right hand side where we just glue the two domains together uh, and satisfy the interface conditions in the correct way. So. This gives us a few advantages uh, compared to standard finite element method. The first is the flexibility in the modeling. Uh, the second is we can use optimal grids for each subdomain. Uh, and this gives us good mesh quality and we can adapt the mesh to physics. Of course, the pre-processing gets much easier if we, if we are able to do this. And another advantage is we can uh, tackle moving parts without remeshing because we don't need a conforming grid at the rotating interface um, and we can simply uh, transfer the relevant quantities. Um, also, structured grids result in a strong reduction of er numerical error and if we have the possibility to use non-conforming grids, uh, generating structured grids is possible for many geometries. As an example, I'd like to highlight the Poisson problem uh, on adjacent domains. Um, here we consider the Poisson problem. We have uh, the standard divergence uh, of a gradient. Uh, on the right hand side, we have a forcing vector, force density f, uh, and we have for simplicity homogeneous Neumann boundary conditions. So the flux on the boundary is zero. Uh, just note that we consider two different domains, omega 1 and omega 2. Uh, of course, the flux boundary, the Neumann condition, only acts uh, on the outer boundary and at the inner boundary. We actually need to interface conditions um, to enforce interface conditions uh, to couple the two domains. And these interface conditions are uh, first, of course, the jump of the unknown must be zero at the interface. So here we use the um, brackets uh, brackets of u uh, denoting the jump. So u1 minus u2 must be zero. And additionally, we have the condition on the flux uh, of the primary quantity. So in our case, this is k times gradient u and the jump in normal direction now must be zero, so we take the normal derivative of u1 with respect to the normal direction uh, times our material parameter k1, this is the flux, and the difference of the fluxes must be zero on the interface boundary. Um, most of the derivations uh, in the following uh, now uh, are based on the book by Manfred Kaltenbacher, here is the reference. Uh, but just to get started, let's recall the re let's recall the weak form of the Poisson problem. Uh, so we have integrated uh, by parts multiplied by a test function. Um, we get the boundary term uh, by integration of parts. So this equation must be satisfied for all test functions, and from this we can straightforwardly uh, derive our finite element formulation for the problem. So now let's go into the mortar method. The key idea here uh, is that we satisfy the flux continuity uh, by a Lagrange multiplier. So we introduce a new uh, dual unknown lambda for the flux. So lambda is equal to the flux now. Uh, and by convention, we take the minus sign here. Uh, and 
as our interface condition states, uh, the fluxes must be the same on both sides of the interface. And the second uh, condition now is our continuity of the unknown, uh, which will be enforced in a weak sense. So what does this mean? Uh, same as for the weak form, we introduce a suitable test function. This will be defined on the interface. We multiply it with our constraint and integrate. And this gives us the following equation. The integral over the coupling surface gamma i of the test function lambda prime times u1 minus u2. So this is our uh, continuity of the unknown equation. And of course, this is zero. Just note that the Lagrange multiplier is defined only at the interface. And uh, so is the corresponding test function. So here lambda prime is only defined um, on the interface. So what happens if we introduce this into our weak form? We write the weak form for each subdomain. Uh, this is a repetition from before. We have our boundary terms that are now defined on the interface. We've already introduced the um, homogeneous Neumann boundary conditions on all the other interfaces uh, and boundaries. Uh, so they're not explicitly mentioned here. And now for each subdomain, we incorporate the mul Lagrange multiplier for uh, subdomain one. This was straightforward. There was just a sign change and the flux was replaced by the new unknown lambda. And the same we do uh, with the surface uh, term on the second side. So this would be uh, the slave side uh, here uh, due to the normal vector that is uh, pointing in the other direction. Um, now we have a different sign. And finally, we add our interface continuity equation in the weak sense, as discussed before, and this gives us the final weak form. Find u1, u2, and the new unknown lambda, such that our equations are satisfied for all suitable test functions. From this weak form, we can see how the discretized system looks like. So we introduce ansatz functions and use the usual Galerkin procedure uh, and then we obtain discretized system. And you can um, see the following structure. We have uh, K1 and K2. These are the standard stiffness matrices of the Poisson problem. And now we have an additional column um, relating to the new unknowns. Lambda, they are just collected in our uh, vector of nodal unknowns. And we have two matrices, D and M, that couple uh, the degrees of freedom U1 and uh, U2 to lambda. And similarly, we get lines for uh, the constraint equation. So this is the last line in this matrix equation. And the right-hand side here is zero, whereas on the other side, we have the right-hand side forcing vectors. So... As I said here, the vectors donate the algebraic vectors for the unknowns, uh, which are now also present um, on the interface as interface fluxes. Note that the coupling matrices D and M, they have non-zero entries only for the interface degrees of freedom, so not uh, at all entries mentioned here, but only um, at the interface degrees of freedom since they come from uh, integrals over uh, the coupling surface only. And uh, the entries for D, they are, can be computed trivially because the answers functions are defined on the master side grid. We have chosen simply the domain one as the master side. Um, whereas on the other uh, matrix M, we have to actually evaluate integrals where we have um, ansatz functions defined on the grid 2, so that's the boundary grid of the slave side, and on the grid 1, which is the um, boundary grid of the master side. So here we need grid intersection operations. So 
So how can we do grid intersections? In 2D, this is rather easy. We can The interface regions are curves in 2D, and if you want to in intersect two curves and you have a plane interface, it's uh, even more easy. But uh, here you have um, four cases of intersection types. Either um, you have an intersection within uh, the two elements, um, or you have an intersection where um, part of one element is actually uh, part of the intersection is the end of one element, uh, or one element is smaller than the other element, so both of the ends are part of the intersection, or the other way around. So these are the intersection types you can have. Um, if the interfaces are not straight, you have to do uh, projections, but uh, similarly, uh, the types of intersections stay the same. Um, when we go to 3D and we only consider plane surfaces, this is, this is a seemingly easy case, uh, but now here illustrate the um, intersection operations of two triangles. You can see uh, that we have here already four different uh, intersection shapes. Uh, the shapes are all different, ranging uh, from a triangle uh, to a quadrangle um, uh, to a polygon with f four, five uh, or six uh, vertices. So intersection operations are rather, rather uh, challenging. Uh, in this case, the intersection po polygon can be subdivided into triangles again. Uh, for the numerical implementation and I give you a reference here um, where you can find a little bit more detail on how this, this works in an implementation. So when you go to three-dimensionally curved surfaces it's even more uh, complex. Here you have to do projection operations. Uh, so here we have an illustration of uh, these curved surfaces on a sphere you see uh, the, the facets actually um, pierce each other um, and uh, you have a lot of um, operations you have to do on the non-coplanar uh, triangles uh, in this case. So the first step is usually you take, um, um, you project uh, the master side onto the slave side plane. So this is red is the master. You project it uh, on the green plane that gives you the bright red um, shape. Uh, then you compute the um, intersection area as uh, before for planar surfaces. Then you triangulate this and then you project the quadrature points of uh, the triangulation uh, back uh, in order to um, evaluate the shape functions on the master side. So let's just uh, recall the key points of the mortar method now. Uh, we have an additional unknown at the interface. This is our Lagrange multiplier, which has a clear physical meaning. Uh, there's no tuning or par penalty parameters, so this is an advantage. Um, however, the discretized system is a settle point, point problem. You remember there were zero diagonal entries there, so we need solvers for the algebraic system that can actually handle systems of this structure. There's also a way around uh, this problem, which is the concept of dual Lagrange multipliers. Uh, so if you um, choose appropriate uh, basis functions, that satisfy the bi-orthogonality relation, then the D matrix becomes diagonal and you can do static condensation uh, to get rid of the Lagrange multipliers. Here I've given you uh, the reference by Bava Wolmut here. Uh, you can read uh, in detail how this works. Look at Nietzsche type motoring. And in the first step, we'll derive the weak form. We again use the Poisson problem uh, to demonstrate this. Uh, so we've written the weak form here now for both domains, domain omega 1 and domain omega 2, and retained the terms on the surface terms on the interface. The Dirichlet boundary conditions have been uh, 
incorporated so these are the only boundary terms we have here. In the first step we'll use the relations of the normal vectors uh, so we can change the sign here in the second boundary term uh, and the first uh, interface uh, normal is defined as the master interface chosen as in the normal vector pointing out of domain 1 and we can also use the transmission condition uh, of the flux uh, so we can replace the flux here in the second boundary term uh, by k1 u1 over n and we have to change the sign uh, in the next step we add the two equations together and what we get here is uh, the standard bilinear forms for the stiffness just the sum of uh, both domains and uh, the same for the right hand side loading and in the interface term we get now uh, the difference in the test function so we can write this in the shorthand uh, notation with the brackets and we can see that this system now got unsymmetric uh, via this term uh, and to make it symmetric again uh, we add another term here and uh, we have here uh, the test function of domain 1 um, in derivative in the normal direction and uh, we add here the jump in the unknown uh, and this also tells us why we can simply add this term because for the true physical solution the jump in the unknown must be zero. So we have added this to retain the symmetry that's nice from a numerical point of view uh, and what we still know need is uh, to guarantee the equality of the unknown uh, on left and right side on, on either side of the interface uh, we add a penalty term so we use a penalty method to enforce this uh, constraint on the unknown uh, and that's the shape uh, the, the shape of the penalty term we have the jump of u and the jump of the test function and uh, here we have a factor of the element size uh, we sum uh, we, we built the uh, integral the total integral of uh, as a sum over the element integrals uh, we have a penalty parameter uh, beta times k bar k bar is the uh, average of the material parameters uh, and beta is the penalty factor that must be appropriately chosen such that the penalty method works so what we finally obtain is the weak form for Nietzsche type motoring uh, reading find u and u2 u1 and u2 uh, such that our weak form equation is fulfilled for all suitable test functions u1 prime and u2 prime uh, here again i've highlighted the different terms we have the consistency term uh, that uh, came up by adding the equations we have the symmetrization term uh, that we have added and uh, this is zero because uh, the jump in u must be zero and we have a penalty term uh, that enforces our unknown uh, to be equal on the on either side of the interface um, and since the equation must hold for all test functions now we, we have the case of written it in, as a single equation we could also write it uh, in at, uh, at, as two different um, two separate equations uh, as the factors of, of the u prime uh, i uh, test functions so how does the discretized system look like um, i've written it here split up in the uh, original systems uh, with the original uh, stiffness matrices uh, k1 and k2 and uh, so are the right hand side so this is just as it would arise without coupling uh, the equations and then we have a, so, so a coupling matrices that uh, come from the bilinear forms that, that we added. These are uh, only um, assembled at the boundary. Uh, U1 and U2 collect all the degrees of freedom in the two different domains. And important is now that these coupling matrices that actually um, achieve the coupling via the non-conforming interfaces have non-zero entries only at the interface degrees of freedom because they are assembled 
uh, over the interface only and not over the complete volume. And uh, you can also see that the system matrices are symmetric in this case. I already mentioned uh, it's not always easy. Uh, we have to specify a penalty factor uh, and uh, it, it turns out that it is uh, suitable that the penalty factor uh, takes into account the element order and the element size uh, via this relation. So if we have the two element orders P1 and P2, um, we take the maximum of the two and square it uh, and uh, we take the minimum uh, element size in the denominator. And uh, beta zero is a parameter that has to be uh, chosen by the user and might be PDE specific and problem specific. Um, so what is the effect of this parameter? The larger you make the penalty factor, uh, the more strictly uh, the uh, continuity over the interface is, is enforced. Uh, of course, you can't um, arbitrarily increase the penalty factor if it will be too small. Uh, you have errors in the constraint. Uh, however, if it's too large, uh, you get into numerical problems because the system matrix becomes ill-conditioned if you have very uh, large entries uh, versus not so large entries. So let's recap the key points of Nietzsche type bordering. We also need intersection operations, same as for classical border. So we have to uh, assemble over the interface with ansatz functions defined on different grids. Uh, so this is uh, equivalent. Um, what is new now is that the assembly requires computations of normal derivatives. You remember we had the uh, gradients um, of the ansatz functions uh, in the uh, bilinear forms. Uh, we need a penal penalization factor that has to be uh, user specified uh, and probably is problem dependent. Um, and uh, if you're interested more about the mathematical proofs uh, for Nietzsche type motoring, uh, you can see the publication by, by Hansbo and Hansbo. Um, the reference is given here. Um, another interpretation of the method is actually um, an internal penalty discontinuous Galerkin method uh, that is applied only at the non-conforming interface and not at, uh, as usual for uh, discontinuous Galerkin methods uh, between all the interfaces. Now, we want to apply this uh, non-conforming grid technique also to other PDEs. Uh, and in fact, uh, the, in the formulation I've shown you is, is not uh, limited uh, to a specific PDE. You can use it, uh, non-conforming grid formulations, uh, both of classical and Nietzsche type motoring um, equivalently for different partial differential equations. Uh, and similarly, it can be applied to elliptic, parabolic or hyperbolic uh, PDEs. For example, in heat conduction, transient heat conduction, we have a parabolic uh, problem uh, and acoustics, we have a hyperbolic problem. Uh, Non-conforming grids work there too. Finally, uh, if you have a direct surface coupling between different PDEs, for example, in vibroacoustics between mechanics and acoustics, uh, this can also be accomplished via non-conforming interface uh, in an equivalent way. The nice thing about this is then you really have different physics that have different meshing requirements and you can uh, simplify the pre-processing quite a bit. Uh, as an example, I now want to show you the coupling between linearized compressible flow equations and solid mechanics. So what are the coupling conditions here? Um, we have the first interface condition, which is the dynamic condition that enforces continuity of the surface traction. So we have uh, the stiffness tensor, uh, the stress tensor in the fluid, viscous fluid V, and the uh, stress tensor in the solid uh, sigma S, 
uh, projected in normal direction gives the surface traction uh, and of course they must be equal on either side of the interface. On the other hand side we have the kinematic condition that enforces the equality, equality of the fluid particle velocity v and the mechanical velocity which is simply the time derivative of the displacement. Uh, so here we have um, this kinematic constraint that we need to enforce. And in the coupling conditions we can now derive the weak form for the classical mortar method. The first step now is to introduce a vector valued Lagrange multiplier for the surface traction since this is a vector valued quantity um, in the boundary term of a balance of momentum for the solid, so this is the equation 38, and the balance of momentum for the fluid, which is equation 39. So here we've already introduced uh, the uh, Lagrange multiplier T in the boundary term and taken care of the correct sign due to the definition of the normal vector. And uh, as a second step we need the kinematic condition uh, which is enforced in a weak sense so is an integral over the coupling region gamma sv uh, where we have inserted the jump term that um, needs to go uh, to zero. Uh, note that this is not a complete set of equations. The balance of mass um, for the fluid is uh, omitted for brevity. However, it stays unaltered by the coupling uh, since uh, there is no relevant boundary term that would be affected. And uh, also the system gets unsymmetric uh, in this case since we have here now the time derivative uh, of one of the unknowns. Uh, as a general application uh, and implementation in OpenCFS, uh, there are several non-conforming uh, grid formulations, usually in classical and Nietzsche type uh, motoring versions available in OpenCFS for single fields. We have acoustics in the pressure and potential formulation, we have electrostatics uh, and heat conduction, uh, we have magnetics in 2D and 3D, so also for edge elements, and we have it implemented in solid mechanics. And uh, as coupled field problems for surface couplings are equivalent, there's also the possibility to use non-conforming interfaces in mechanic acoustics, so vibroacoustics problems, and in couplings uh, to the linearized um, compressible flow equations, so the lin flow PDE coupled to solid mechanics and uh, to acoustics where you can use non-conforming grids. What is important when you model with non-conforming uh, interfaces, just um, uh, some general hints. First, discretize each domain as required by the physics. This is clear, you have to do this uh, even if you couple with conforming interfaces. Um, you should also avoid um, too large size differences over the interface. So non-conforming grids are, can do a lot, uh, but try to stay uh, below mesh size increases or decreases by a factor of say approximately 100. Uh, this is already a, a much larger jump than you can accomplish with anything that should be conforming. Um, you need a large transition region and with, by non-conforming grid uh, techniques you can do this instantly. Uh, a practical technicality, so to say, is that the mesh generator must allow for non-conforming interfaces, so it must be able to generate an independent mesh on both sides of a shared uh, geometrical entity as an interface. And uh, of course you need to name the boundary elements on both sides of the interfaces uh, separately so you can actually define the region where the coupling should take place and define which is the master side and which is the slave side. I finally added uh, some references here uh, that I've used throughout the presentation so if you're interested you can look them up uh, and as usual in the end, there are a few questions uh, for learning reinforcement.